Our next speaker is Elad Singer on, again, quenching and environment. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Elad Singer. I'm uh, currently at the Hebrew University. We'll be applying for jobs this, uh, this fall. And I'm going to talk about slow motion of satellite galaxies in the outskirts of galaxy clusters. So this is work I've done with... Uh, Work I've done with Abishai and uh, this kind of guy and Andrew Kreptov. So first of all, a bit of motivation. <clears throat> so we know galaxies and clusters are more likely to be quenched than uh, galaxies in the field. And this is not a new thing. But in recent years, we found that this relation actually extends beyond the virial radius of clusters. And you can actually find more quenched galaxies compared to the field, even beyond one R vir. And we're going to try and answer how this came to, came to be. So, of course, some people have suggested solutions like pre-processing. These galaxies were actually quenched before they entered the cluster. Or splashback galaxies, the galaxies actually went through the cluster and came outside. But another option is that the cluster influence actually extends beyond one dar -Vir. And when you actually go and look at simulations, you discover that this actually is correct. So what I have here is four pictures of clusters from a hydrodynamical simulation. The white circle is the virial radius. And this is an entropy. You can see the shock. This is the accretion shock, which heats the gas to the virial temperature. And it extends out to two times, to even three times, sometimes even more, of the virial radius. So the intercluster medium actually extends out way beyond the virial radius. And the cluster influence extends out that far as well. And this is true as early as redshift 0.6. Okay, So this is about six giga years ago. <clears throat> Another nice thing you can see here is that the, the shocks, which are forming around the clusters, there's shocks also around the filaments heating the gas coming in. So how can we address self-formation quenching beyond our view? So first of all, I want to make two important distinctions. There's two ways of, of people think about quenching galaxies. One is you just strip the galaxy from the gas by some you know, strong force, stripping, taking all the ga gas out. And then you don't have any gas. You can't form stars. Self-formation quenching happens fast. Another way is what's called starvation or st strangulation, a very violent term for some reason. You remove the gas reservoir, which can feed the galaxy, the hot halo around the gas. You remove that, and the, gas can't re the galaxy can't replenish its gas supply. And then it uses up what gas it has inside it, forming stars. And when it doesn't have any gas anymore, then it quenches. And this is a much slower process. <laughs> and possible mechanisms we can, chew, can do you know, both of these things. So we have ram pressure stripping, uh, which we talk, heard a little bit about, which is just the, the pressure that you feel when moving through a gaseous medium. There's tidal stripping, which has a very strong radial dependence. And there's you know, thermal evaporation. There's also a few other processes. But the point is that when we're outside of the real radius, then tidal stripping and thermal evaporation are, are not as strong as they are inside clusters. So ram pressure stripping, we felt, was the way to go. So how are we going to uh, approach this? We're, our method is this. We, we're assuming that ram pressure stripping is the dominant mechanism. We're going to address starvation scenario and gas stripping scenario separately, but we're going to address them both. And to do that, we're going to use analytic toy models for the galaxies themselves, and then we'll throw them into the simulation and see how the cluster environment affects these model galaxies. So first of all, let's talk about stripping the gas halo, what's known as the strangulation scenario. So we're going to assume a very simple model for, for the uh, satellites. We're going to assume that, first of all, that the cluster is, is a isothermal sphere and that the satellite is an isothermal sphere. And we're going to assume the, travels tra the satellites travel at the real, radio, real velocity. And we're going to assume the stripping is instantaneous. This is just to get a very simple working model. And when you do that, you can find the RAM pressure. Not very, easy to, not very hard to calculate. You can compare that to the gravitational binding force. Comparing the two, you can find a stripping radius. And from there, you can find how much mass is remaining inside the satellite halo. Now, the point is about how do you calculate this gravitational force? So, it's not that simple. The ram pressure stripping is not a very, it's a simple project process to envision. But to actually model, it's kind of hard because you have something spherical, but it's moving in a certain direction. So there's a preferred direction. And how do you exactly model the gravitational force in this case? So there's several different ways that we explore. You can do it just by calculating the force on spherical shells. And that's, that's, you know, that's very easy to do. But how, do you, how does that relate to the movement? And you can find a cylindrical tube in the direction of motion and find what the gravitational pull on that. And you can also use pressure as a proxy for the gravitational binding force, because you assume that there's hydrostatic equilibrium. And you can do all of these things. But the cool thing is, and when you go out and try to do it analytically, you all end up with the same kind of form. You end up with this form, which is exactly what you get from dimensional analysis. And there's always a, a factor here, a prefactor, which is of order of one. 
So we're going to use this form, and this prefactor is going to be a fudge factor, a knob, where we, we can use to turn up the stripping or turn down the stripping and then see how that affects the results. So we did that, and what you find is that the stripping is very efficient. So what, I'm see what we're seeing here, this is the radius in units of the real radius of the cluster, and this is the amount of mass inside the gas halo, and the lines are different mass fractions, satellite to halo. And typical satellites in clusters are these are you know, in this range here. 10 to the 3 minus 10 to, the, 10 to the 4 minus 10 to the 3, these three lines here. And you can see that at the real radius, you've already moved more than 85% of your, your gas. And most, for most satellites, you've removed more than 90, maybe even 95% of your gas. Stripping is very strong. Even at redshift, even at two times the real radius, you've already removed more than 80 or 90% of your gas. So it's a very, very strong stripping. Now, you might say that this is just a, I mean, maybe you're not doing this correctly or whatever, but if I actually use this fudge factor, okay, so now I have a color histogram of, of this is the mass fraction again of satellite to halo, and this is the, the, that knob that I can turn up and down, and even when I turn it way down, you know, I still get very substantial stripping for the typical satellites. So you can remove most of the gas and let's uh, look at this in uh, simulated clusters. I can do the same thing now. I have this suite of 16 cluster simulations. I can put my satellites in different places in the cluster and see what kind of stripping force they'd feel. And you can see that once again, at this is for the red is for two real radii. This is for one real radii. This is at two different redshifts. And you can see that all, for all these clusters, a 10 to the 11 solar mass satellite would be stripped of most of its gas. 80, 90% of its gas would be gone by the time it reaches the real radius. So the Hell gas reservoir can be effectively removed before the satellite reaches our rear just by ram pressure stripping. So what about galaxies themselves? I removed the, the halo. What about the galaxies? What can I do about the galaxies? So again, I have an, the same model. I'm going to assume once again the, the intercluster medium is as a thermal sphere. The galaxies I'm going to assume are traveling face on. And that's just because I want the maximal effect of ram pressure stripping. So they're all going to be traveling face on. And the total binding force is dominated by the component within the disk. You can actually show that, but I'm not going to go into that now. Now we have to model the disk, though. So, di so galaxies, they have a stellar disk, they have a gaseous disk, they have a stellar bulge, a dark matter halo. And I can model these with analytic models, exponential disk, a Hernquist profile for the bulge, uh, NFW profile for the halo. You have a bunch of free parameters here, about order of 10 free parameters. That's a pretty large... Uh, parameter space, but if you take all this and you write it out, you can get a simple form for the gravitational binding force. It's a nice equation here with a bunch of Bessel functions going all different directions. But you can get the, you can get the gravitational binding force. Now once you do that, then you can do one of two things. You can start exploring this parameter space by, you know, setting one, all the parameters fixed and just changing one. That will give you a huge pile of figures that nobody can make uh, sense of. Or, you can build mock catalogs. So what we did is we used this galaxy model and then we just chose the parameters to get a large sample of many different galaxy shapes and to kind of, to kind of to guide our way we used a bunch of observational or observations from simulations which help us set these things. So we can use the Mohman white uh, formalism to find the, the scale radius of the disk and we can do a data contraction and then we can use, you know, Moster et al. or Bruiser et al. to get the halo mass, the stellar mass, and you can use uh, Bullock et al. to get the spin parameter, and use all of these things, then remove unstable galaxies because we want star-forming disks, and end up with about you know, 20,000 galaxies in a catalog, which will let us explore how ramp stripping affects them. And this is what we see here. So what we're seeing here, these are just contours of the galaxy population at different radii. This is a 2 rvir 1 rvir f r vir and 0.2 r vir and this is the parameter this is the surface density the stellar surface density of the galaxy and this is how much stripped mass how much mass has been stripped gas how much gas mass has been stripped from the galaxy and we can see that at 2 r vir and 1 r vir you know, there's a little bit of, of the population which has been slightly stripped but most of the population still retains its gas beyond 1 r vir and only when you go down to about half r vir you start seeing substantial stripping taking place. And, and in the centers, of course, most of the galaxies have been stripped of most of their gas. So this tells us that you can't really remove gas from the, the galaxy itself beyond the real radius. And this is the same thing just looking at our simulated clusters 
and seeing how that happens in a more, more realistic environment. Once again, as the satellites move in, and this is for three different satellite masses, you can see that only when, you, when you're inside the real radius, only then does the, are you actually removing gas from the galaxy itself. Okay, great. So now we can sum up our galaxy stripping results. And we can see that the mass stripping in galaxies is ineffective beyond the real radius. That's, that's what we found. And only at about half our beard does it actually start affecting the gas inside the galaxy. Now you have to remember that what I showed you is mass stripping, but what we see is star formation quenching. And we have to remember that star formation quenching and mass loss are not a linear thing. So actually, if you take the Schmidt law, you can see that to have a 50% reduction in star formation rate, you have to lose 70% of the gas. Okay, so if I showed you that you, can't, that you only remove a small fraction of the gas, that means that star formation is going to be even a worse <coughs> relation. So the only way we can quench star formation in galaxies beyond the real radius is if we do this by starvation. If we can get the gas depletion in the galaxy to occur before the satellites reach the real radius, then the galaxy will be quenched. So we can remove the gas. We saw we can remove the gas from the halo very easily before we reach our veer. And whether or not the galaxy will use up its gas will tell us if the galaxy is quenched or not. So what we did, we tried to calculate kind of the travel time. How much time would a satellite take to go from crossing the initial accretion shock at around two or three real radii till it reaches one hour of year? And for the clusters, either for these, these are just the calculations we got for the clusters themselves. So the typical traveling times are order several giga years, okay? up until sometimes maybe even 10 in some, in some clusters. And that is longer than typical depletion times, which are order of a giga year. So what we're seeing here is that you can, you can get quenched galaxies at the real radius just by starving them of their gas. So, conclusions. Uh, the environmental universe, if I have some more time, then there's another, okay, oh, I spoke fast this time. So one thing I wanna talk about is we still see star forming galaxies in the clusters themselves. And I just told you that you can you know, quench galaxies very, very easily. So what's up with that? Well, first of all, one thing that, that may be happening, and those of you who were here in my talk last year, I talked about gas streams, which feed clusters. So clusters, these cold flows that we all know, which feed high redshift galaxies, also exist in clusters at low redshift, only they're not cold anymore. But you still get streams which can penetrate to the center of the cluster. And a galaxy which is traveling along the stream will feel much less ram pressure stripping because it's co-moving with its environment. And ram pressure stripping only happens if there's relative velocity between you, you and the gaseous medium around you. So if you're actually flowing along the stream, the ram pressure you're going to feel is going to be much, much weaker. And maybe, won't, maybe you won't be losing your gas as much. And also, what? Um, not necessarily all the time exactly along the stream. I, I haven't checked this, so this is just a, a, a hypothesis. That, that, they might, that those that, that are traveling along streams might not be quenched as others. And I'm not sure that all galaxies travel all the time along exactly along the stream. Some of them might be at the outskirts. Some of them might actually leave the stream once they're in the, re, in the region, once they cross the shock. This is something that, that we need to be checked. But it's an, it's an option that may allow for galaxies to retain their gas. And also, the depletion times, what I told you about depletion times and travel times, well, that's true you know, in an average sense, but there's a, quite a large scatter in quenching times and in travel times. So you could have gas which, galaxies which reach inside the cluster before depleting all their gas, and then they will still be star forming within the cluster. So, to end up my conclusions, the environmental influence of the ICM does extend out to much larger radii than the real radius. And ramp pressure stripping can remove the gas reservoir from the satellites, but not from the gas themselves before reaching the real radius. And then they can quench by starvation. And if you go inside this inner, inner cluster, then you can, of course, remove gas from the satellite completely. Thank you. So I'm, <coughs> I'm curious about, I, I'm glad that you've done this bookkeeping and, and thought about it. Um, I'm curious about what happens when you add stellar or AGN feedback into, because I mean at some level our hydrodynamical models tell us that there's 
uh, flow of material mm -hmm. uh, into and out of these star forming disks that you're that you're talking about yes uh, and so I'm constantly moving this stuff that's hard to strip into an easier to strip phase for a while and then it comes back etc mm -hmm. so that that presumably makes this even easier yes uh, okay to to quench or to become quiescent than you than you imagine which you already argue they this is maybe an overestimate compared to the to the real universe have you had thoughts on on how to how to incorporate uh this cycling of gas between the disc and the halo in, mm. into this kind of framework not so much um my, my model was mostly instantaneous. I mean, it's not a dynamical model in which I actually evolve the, the, the galaxy as I, as I go along. Um, it would be possible maybe to, to add some sort of uh, you know, random uh, assumption about how much gas is, has been ejected. So that could be, it could be interesting to add that. I, I, we could talk about it later. It would be interesting to add that. Any other question? Uh. I just have a comment. Yes. Uh, it's very interesting you show uh, the, viral re uh, the viral shock go way beyond viral radius. Mm -hmm. And my comment is, uh, so if uh, low mass halos grow in those uh, preheated uh, environment, mm -hmm. so those uh, halos uh, may not really create a baryon at cosmic rate because the uh, intergalactic medium is already preheated. They, had, they have finite uh, uh, pressure. So uh, it will make uh, uh, all this uh, even more easier because the halos start from a low baryon situation. Okay. Thank you. okay. Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.